In this video, I'll be talking about stack-based subprogram implementation, which is the main implementation used in all modern programming languages and allows for recursion. However, I'll first be showing you an example that does not use recursion using the same code from the previous video. Now, even when we're not using recursion, we are still going to use a program stack. This is where we will place our activation records. Notice that I've modified the code of the main function slightly to add these two local variables, R1 and R2. These will be inside our first activation record, which is placed on the stack. So this is the activation record for the main function. When the main function calls sub1, the next activation record goes on top of this. Notice that the general structure of the activation record looks the same as in the previous video. And as before, at the point when sub1 is called, we populate the parameters x and y with their actual values, 3 and 6, and we specify the return address, which I'm writing this time as main function line 15. Once again, this would be a very precise memory address within machine code for an actual compiled program, but we're keeping things simple for the sake of this video. The return value is not specified yet, and also notice that the local variables in the main function R1 and R2 don't have values yet either. In reality, there would be some leftover contents in memory that would populate these memory cells, but what's important is that we've allocated storage for these variables or return values, and they'll be filled in when necessary. Now, the return value for the call to sub1 is going to be 9, so that gets placed there, and then we can return to line 15, at which point this return value 9 will be copied into R1, and we will remove this activation record for sub1 from the stack. The next thing that the main function does is call sub2. So now we'll put that activation record on top of the stack. The next activation record has the parameter value for D and the return address filled in. And the rest of the values get filled in during execution. Truncated takes on a value of 4. However, to get the value for result, we must make another function call. We call sub1. So the activation record for sub1 will be added on top of this. And now we have the activation record for sub1 with its parameter values of 4 and 5 filled in and its return address specified as line 7 of the function sub2. Once again, it would be more precise in an actual implementation. Now I want to emphasize at this point that although I'm showing three separate stacks to kind of show the progression over time, there's really only one program stack. Um, memory will only look like what we have in this final column. So activation records are added onto the stack and then removed from it. I just happen to be also showing what the past versions of the stack looked like in earlier parts of this diagram. Now, during execution, we take 4 and 5, those get added together, and that gives us a result of 9 here and this function completes, so it will return to where it left off, line 7 in function sub 2, and the value of result will be filled in. And that means this activation record can be removed, and we'll go back one step in our diagram. Now that the value of result is filled in in the activation record, we can compute the return value of d times result and get 38.7. And then this function is finished executing, so we will remove it from the stack and also give this return value to R2. And here we have our variables R1 and R2 with their values. At this point, the printf function will be called to print these values. And technically, those would also appear on the program stack, though I won't show that. And then the program would execute the stack would be emptied, and then we're done. Next, I'm going to show you an example that does use recursion, but I'm going to switch languages. This is some Python code. It's a simple recursive function that computes x raised to the power of y for integers. 
Now, I'm going to demonstrate how this works using a website, pythontutor.com. Here we see our code on the left, and we're going to step through the execution one bit at a time. Now, Python will first define the function, and then there is a call to pow25, which will eventually print the result. So we have this global frame referencing that function call, and we're going to step through the calls. And as I click Next, we'll see that it's actually adding the activation record. Here they're called frames. Um, but we have the values of the parameters, and we're also going to see that things get dynamically filled in here, such as the values of local variables and also return values. So as I continue through each line of code, we'll see that because y is not 0, we skip this if and go to the else case, and we'll start doing these calculations. So I'm going to assign a value to n, and now n is 2, and that's been added to our activation record or our frame. So in Python, everything happens dynamically. We don't have to specify the exact structure of um, our storage in advance. We simply add things as we go. Next, I make this call to pow xn, which the values x and n here are 2 and 2, and that's why we see values of 2 and 2 here in the next frame or activation record. And then we'll step through this function again. We check if y is 0. It's still not. Therefore, we'll go down here. We'll compute a value of n within this stack frame. That value is 1. We're dividing y by 2 and then rounding down. That's what the int does. And then we have another recursive call. So we have another frame. And I want to keep this in view. Um, so we have values of 2 and 1 as our parameters. We'll go next. Still not 0, so we're going to compute a new value for n. This n actually is 0. And so we're going to have to make the recursive call. But on this call, the parameter values are 2 and 0. And so we'll see that when we step through the code up here, we'll check if y equals 0, and that will be true. So we'll check that. Because that is true, we'll return 1. And that gets added to the frame here. Let me scroll down so you can see it. There's now a return value of 1. So this frame, or activation record, is about to be deleted. But the return value will be passed back to the caller. And you'll see in the code that we were assigning the value of that recursive call to a variable, a new variable called x to n. So I will click Next. And we see that that frame went away. But the previous frame now has x to n equal to 1. And so now we can step through the code from that point. We check to see if y is even. That's what the check here is. It is not. So we'll be in the else case, where we'll be returning x to n times x to n times x. And so that is the return value you see here. That's 2. So that's 1 times 1 times 2, so a value of 2. And then we'll go next. That frame goes away, and the value 2 is stored in x to n within the previous frame. We continue. This time, y is even. So instead, we'll return x to n times x to n, so simply 2 times 2. So our return value is 4. And when I go to the next step, this frame will be eliminated, and we'll go up and store that value in x to n within the previous frame, as you can see here. And next, y is odd again, so we're going to be in the else case. We'll compute x to n times x to n times x. So that's 4 times 4 times 2. So 4 times 4 is 16, times 2 is 32, 
hence the return value of 32, which then gets returned to this call here and printed directly to the console output. So that is how a stack-based subprogram implementation can execute recursive code. And although we're showing this example in Python, um, it holds for pretty much all modern languages.